Welcome to Out of the Fog. I'm Melissa Royal Critch. Tonight we're joined by Helen Eskett. She's a novelist, a best-selling novelist from right here in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. And her two novels, Operation Wormwood and Operation Vanished, uh, weave together elements of uh, crime drama, medical drama, religious aspects, and really great suspense and wonderful characters. So she's here to talk with us about all of that. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be right back with Helen Eskett. You're watching Rogers TV, St. John's. Woo! Go for a ride. Awesome! You're going to step up. Rogers TV, St. John's. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. I'm here with Helen Eskett, a best-selling author from right here in St. John's. Uh, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So let's jump into your first novel, Operation Wormwood here. For anybody who hasn't uh, yet read it, kind of give us the teaser without any spoilers. Well, Operation Wormwood came when I was at a point in my life when I was asking people and I had retired from a career as a civilian member in the RCMP. So I was at a point in my life when I was saying, why is it evil against the most vulnerable people in the world always goes unpunished by an all loving, all powerful God? Why, why does that happen? And I kept questioning that and writing it down and, and it turned into Operation Wormwood. And that's basically what the book is about is, is why does evil against the most vulnerable always go unpunished? And in your book, of course, it doesn't go unpunished. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't want to give too much away because it's such a great read, but um, people who have, I guess, committed crimes and, you know, in the book's case, it's pedophilia, it yeah. are affected by, by wormwood. Yes. So, you know, tell us, I guess, a bit about, like, just the start of the novel and, and you know, how you came up with this um, idea and, fl and flesh it out in such a real way. Well, the book came from, I wanted to find a way to give, I always say, to give vengeance to victims mm. and to create paranoia among pedophiles, to s literally scare the life out of them. <laughs> and that's what wormwood is. And wormwood is a term from the Bible. It's a plant in the Bible that's uh. very bitter. It's also, if you remember Macbeth from high school, and I'm a huge Shakespeare <laughs> fan, it's how King Macbeth is killed. He takes wormwood. So that's why I, I came up with the term wormwood. So it's a disease that makes pedophiles die, a very slow and painful death. And there's a doctor, Dr. Gillespie, at the Health Science Complex who has to deal with these people and he's trying to figure out how they got infected, what did they get into and why are they dying. And then there's a police officer, Sergeant Nicholas Myra, uh, from the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary who is investigating it and he thinks there's a serial killer who is going out of maybe who was might have been a victim of a pedophile who was now going out and killing them somehow and he's trying to figure out who it is and then of course the catholic church comes out there's a priest father peter cook and uh, he uh, decides that god is back with a vengeance and he is here to decide the good from the evil and i love that good versus evil thing that comes into your book because you know, one of my favorite TV shows uh, a couple years ago was Dexter, right? About oh, the serial killer Dexter. that only kills serial killers. <laughs> and it, it messes with your mind because you don't really know who you're supposed to feel bad for or who you're cheering for because the good and bad is kind of turned on its head. Yes. Um, do you think there's something about the human psyche that makes us, you know, drawn into these stories? You know, in this case, you know, you feel bad for somebody who's sick, but given the backstory of these characters you've created, they don't feel so bad. No, and I love Dexter too. Absolutely loved it because I mean you're rooting for a serial killer, and then you're kind of thinking, why am I doing that? <laughs> but uh, and it's it's the same with Operation Wormwood. Is that this disease is making people die a very slow and painful death? But the whole point of it is they're marked by the blood of the lamb, and that's also where wormwood comes from. So uh, and and so when you get wormwood, there you don't need to go to court to prove your innocent or guilt. The fact that you're marked with the blood of the lamb and you have wormwood, you're guilty because no one gets it who's not guilty. So it gives, I, I had a, a victim of uh, pedophilia 
tell me that it gave them closure. It, reading this kind of gave them a little bit of closure and I thought, okay, that's, that's amazing. But, um, you know, I, I think people enjoy it. Of course, you don't want to see anybody suffer, but to certain people, you don't mind suffering. Because, the, and that's what the book appeals to, is that inner seed in you that really wants to make them suffer. Yeah, and you, you know, your, your book is so unique because, you know, it's not a crime thriller in the traditional sense where you're trying to like solve, you know, it's not a whodunit. I mean, it's, it has elements of that, but it brings in, you know, kind of a, a health, a medical drama, and yeah. it brings in, like you say, the religious aspect to it. So how tough is it to weave all those together into, I guess, such a cohesive story? Well, you know, it's it's not a book with the usual crime suspects, that's for sure. You're not going to guess the ending of it. It really comes down to your own beliefs and values, what the ending is. And I get a lot of emails from people going, oh, my goodness, you better write a follow-up. And there is a follow-up coming to Wormwood. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, I think to write a good story, you have to live it. And I think because I lived it for eight years and er, 18 years in the RCMP as their communications and media relations uh, specialist, I saw so much that really it was my the only way my own mind could actually deal with the things that I did see was by writing it down and dealing with it. And and that's you know truth is stranger than fiction, and you would be shocked when you find out what people do to other people. And, um, you know, and that's where the story, that's where the seed of the story came from was uh, there was one particular case uh, where I said to my partner at the time, you know, I wish there was something that would happen to people when they hurt children. Because when children are the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable people, uh, they can't fight back. Babies can't fight back. Two-year-olds can't fight back. And when you see it, you can't unsee it. You never unsee the abuse of a child. It never leaves your brain. This is why so many, you know, people in policing have issues with PTSD and and uh, um, other different types of operational injuries uh, because you can't unsee it. So the only way I could unsee it was to write it down and get my own revenge. When I first wrote Wormwood, I really just wrote it for myself. I didn't think anybody else would ever want to read it. So I was shocked when Flanker said yes, they would publish it. And then when it became a bestseller, and I started to realize, I'm not the only sick one out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, your passion for justice um, is evident in the book and in talking to you. But it also comes through that you, um, you know, are a stickler for detail. And it, your, mm -hmm. like you say, your 18-year experience with the RCMP comes through uh, in the description of the investigation. Yes. So what are some of the kind of you know, specific lessons you learned working with the police for so long that you were able to weave into your book? Well, I, I ran both books like they were real investigations. I did timelines, I did research on every single character, and one of the biggest compliments I get is when a police officer reads the <laughs> book and sends me a message, she goes, you know, that's a great investigation. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that's what makes it real. It's the, you, because I know the inside of policing, the books I wrote from the inside of policing, not just somebody who interviewed a police officer and is now going to write a story about it. I ran this as a real investigation. And I like hearing about the feedback you received from some police officers, but I also understand that you sent the book to some religious leaders. Yes. What was the kind of motivation behind that? Were you hoping to hear back and did you hear back? I did. I sent it to um, the Archbishop in Dublin because they were going through a huge church scandal. And uh, um, and he wrote me back a letter that said, yeah, he read it and he really enjoyed it. Wow. Uh, I sent it to Pope Francis and said, with a communication strategy, because that's what I do, I write strategies, a research, and said, listen, here's how you fix your church. Never heard back from him. Maybe he didn't get it. I would imagine there's a whole buffer of people who keeps him from real people. So um, it, it's too bad, because I think he would have got something out of it. And, uh, um, and I also sent it to Archbishop Curry before he retired, and he called me, uh, frightened the life out of me when you answer your phone and go, this is Archbishop Curry, and you're like, oh, my God, what did I do? But <laughs> he actually said he liked the book, and, and he enjoyed it. And in the book, this is not an anti-religious book, because people will look at the basilica on the front cover and think, oh, this, you're just anti-religious. No, the, the priest in this book is actually the hero. 
Father Peter Cook is one of the main characters, and he's the hero. He's actually the good guy in the church. He, he's the one who wants to, had a true calling to be a priest and really wants Wormwood to be real. He wants it to run its course. So this priest, Peter, um, in your book, who's obviously a very complex character, um, you know, dealing with this on behalf of the church and, and playing the hero role in the book, really, you know, where do you come up with these characters and how do you, how do you shape them uh, to play uh, such a big part in your book? Well, the best part about Operation Wormwood, it's a thriller on three different levels. First, you, you read it as a crime thriller, and then the second time you read it, you have to go Google the names of all the characters because they all have special meaning. Yeah. So uh, Sergeant Nicholas Myra, who is one of the main characters, if you Google his name, you'll find out he's named after St. Nicholas, who is the patron saint of protecting children, who's Santa Claus, from a town called Myra. Uh, Agatha Cantina, who is the nurse, she's named after St. Agatha, who is the patron saint of nursing. And Peter Cook is named after St. Peter, who is the rock that the church was built on. And uh, he's also named after Reverend Rob Cook from St. Mark's from my church. He was a huge uh, contributor to the book, so I named the character after him. So they're all named after real people or characters, so you, you kind of got to Google it. And then people also take Operation Wormwood and they go around town looking for the locations, and they call it, uh, I've had people tell me it's Newfoundland's Da Vinci Code, because they'll go out <laughs> and they'll follow the line around St. John's, and they'll, I've had people email me and say, I've never heard of this Veiled Virgin, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, you go down to the presentation house and in the mother house, and you knock on the door and you go in, and That's it's right. there, and I've had people tell me, I've lived here all my life, I've gone to that church all my life, I never knew there was a Veiled Virgin, never knew there was a statue of Christ with the doctors, never knew they were there, and gone to that church for my whole life. So they go out and they go looking for this thing, so that's that's fun when they come, they send me pictures and stuff, so it's great, I love it. Does that add pressure that you feel like you have to make sure all the directions are right, you can't say, you know, she turned left yeah. and ran down here, but really, oh, no, 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 that's right from there. <laughs> well, it's, right, it's why I put so much research yeah, into the I'd book, say. because people will call you out on it. They want it, to, and people get caught up in the story. They want it to be real, and they, they really get invested mm -hmm. into this story, and I've had people email me and go, what happens to this character, and what's going on? I was like, I don't know. He hasn't told me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Operation Wormwood is a fantastic book, and I know our readers are going to check it out if they haven't already, but if you're good to stick around, we'll be back for uh, more about your next book, Operation Vanished. Stay tuned. We'll be right back on Out of the Fog. All right, girls. Uh, Mom, you said it's played again. Workplace injuries hurt the most at home. Sometimes it's hard to say goodbye to an old friend. But when you're saying farewell to your vehicle, Kidney Car makes it fast and easy. Just call or visit our website. We'll take any vehicle in any condition and give you a tax receipt for a minimum of $300. No headaches and no towing charges. It's the one-stop solution for getting rid of your unwanted vehicle in just a few short minutes. When your vehicles reach the end of the road, call us toll-free or visit kidneycar.ca. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. We are here with Helen Eskett, the author of Operation Wormwood, which we just spoke about, and now on to your next book, Operation Vanished. Um, so I guess for anyone who hasn't read Vanished yet, it's only been out for a little while, uh, give us the teaser on that one. What's, what's the premise of that story? Operation Vanished is an investigation into murdered women in rural Newfoundland in the 1950s and how the belief in the fairy culture in this province played a huge role in how violence against women was normalized. Wow. I mean, that's, it's a pretty heavy topic. I mean, especially yeah. considering, you know, what's been going on lately with the, the National Enquiry and uh, murder of missing Indigenous women. There's lots of unsolved mysteries of, of women disappearing in this province. Yes. Um, does it, how does it feel to write something that's so serious and so close to home? Does that, does that affect you? It, well, it, the reason I picked that subject is because it was very important to me because the stats about missing women aren't right. I mean, they, they were only kept for so many years, but there are lots of cases of missing women that were never reported, especially on rural Newfoundland sure. when you start talking about, you know, the 1960s and 50s and 40s and going back. There's a lot of times the cases against women weren't, uh, report it and they'd say things like oh the fairies took her away or you know wh whatever there'd always be an excuse but 
you know, the reality of the time was that they, they were, it might have taken police a day or two to get to a community. Uh, the media certainly didn't go out and cover cases in remote areas. So it was easy for these cases to disappear. And I, I've certainly heard of the fairy culture in Newfoundland. I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, did that happen that people kind of blamed mysteries on the fairies? What, what did you uncover in your research about that? So fairies were a way people in isolated communities kind of explain things they couldn't explain or didn't want to explain. So, you know, that often you hear things like, you know, she was fairy led or a fairy blast okay, or the sure. fairies took her away. A woman would show up with a, a broken nose or a black eye and they'd go, oh, that's a fairy blast, wow. when they all knew who the fairies were. Sure. So, of course, your book, you know, going back to your investigation and background with the police, you know, it tries to solve this mystery. Yes. And you do a lot of research, and your characters do a lot of research. Yes. Um, including a special archivist. Yes. Um, so I understand the archivist who uh, plays a big role in your book is actually based on a real person. So could you tell us about that? Yes, Larry Doey. So Larry Doey and I became friends about a year and a half ago uh, when I was doing the research on Vanished. And I went down and uh, to the rooms and had uh, tea with him, and we talked about it, and I said, Give me three or four characters that would be on reproach. Who would come in and out of communities that would never be suspected? So he gave me the list, and we did a lot of research, and I would send him questions, and he would have them within 30 seconds. So like, how do you know this information? <laughs> and was so in, he, I, in the beginning, I, I, he was never a character in the book. And then as I was writing the book, there was no way I could use the information without attributing it to somebody who knew it. And so I brought him in as a minor character, but the character kept coming back. The character wanted to be a main <laughs> character. So he ended up actually as the, the second lead in the book. Yeah, and I, I've said it before on the show, but I'll say it again, that you wouldn't believe the number of writers and authors and, and speakers who've come on the show and, and give thanks to Larry Doey. Of course, he was a friend of mine as well, but um, yeah. you know the, the amount of books that he didn't write but he helped with is yes. incredible. And, you can certainly see his influence in your book. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad he ended up in the book because, I mean, you know, after he, he was at the book launch and then he passed away and I was shocked. I was shocked. I'm still shocked about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad, you know, I think maybe it was kind of like the universe's way of pay, playing tribute to him for all the books he did help write is he's in this book and he'll live forever in that book. That's really nice. And, of course, the book, you know, both of your books have a real kind of Newfoundland history element yes. to them. Are you, have you always been, a, I guess, a student of Newfoundland history? I guess as a Newfoundlander, it's just kind of, in, you know, we all put are. in us. We, we <laughs> all have that thing. But one of the things I realized that became really important, because I was in the RCMP when we went through um, the, the National uh, Missing Inquiry into, you know, missing and Aboriginal women. I was there when that began. And when these, you know, when uh, Picton started out in, in BC with the murder of women and, and you know been on the Dana part of the doing media for the Dana Bradley file for 18 years so I had always been part of that so it's always been kind of in my universe so um, it was natural for me to write on it but and I was also part of the RCMP you know when they went through their whole, whole harassment and uh, of women in the force so uh, I was there for the beginning and the whole lifeline of that so there's a line, uh, the, the main character in the book, her name is uh, Corporal Gail McNaughton, and she's named after um, Gail Courtney, who uh, is, uh, she retired as a staff sergeant, who she was in the first uh, troop of females from Newfoundland who went to the RCMP depot. And, uh, and the second person was uh, Inspector Gail Mc or Chris McNaughton. Yeah. And Chris was in major crime, and she mentored me for years. And Gail was the one who hired me. So these two women kind of mentored me throughout my whole career. And they always, you know, I've often got asked, you know, what was the gla glass ceiling like? There was no glass ceiling for me because they broke it. So I was able to reach beyond. So the character's named after them, but there's a line in the book where she's fighting with her supervisor. And she says, you know, every day ordinary men can join this force. When will the day be that an ordinary woman can join a police force who doesn't have to be extraordinary? Mm. So I love that line, and Thank I don't you. know where it came from. It just kind of, I came from my own anger, I guess. But uh, the, the book really is about the history of women and why we kind of went through the Me Too movement, why it fizzled out, 
uh, and, and why we are where we are today. Are there any lessons you think or you'd like people to learn from the book? Well, yeah, I mean, in the book, and I don't, it's not a history lesson. You're not going to read a whole bunch of dry history, but it kind of comes out. So in the book, it's brought out that in 1929 was when women became persons under law in Canada. So my mother was born in 1927. So for the first two years of her life, she wasn't a person according to the law. So when women back then went missing or murdered, nobody cared. Why weren't they solved? Nobody really cared. <laughs> they weren't people. Uh, you know, it was 1964 before women were allowed to open a bank account without a man's signature. So women who were in abusive relationships, why didn't they leave? If your grandmother was in a, re uh, or your mother was in an abusive relationship, why didn't she leave? She couldn't get a bank account. She couldn't get a car. She couldn't get an apartment. A lot of barriers. You know, a lot of pressure. I was born in 63. So we're not talking 100 years ago. Sure. And then it was 1983 before the rape laws in Canada were changed that it became illegal for a man to rape his wife. Now in 83, I'm 20 years old, I'm out of high school. So we're not talking 100 years ago. 1983, it was legal for a man to rape his wife, even if they had separated and she was living somewhere else and he raped her. So why are why are we having these issues with women? Why do we need a Me Too movement and everything else like that? It's because women's rights are not that old. And in the book, I compare it to the civil rights movement in the States. You know, it was the 1950s also when black people became persons under law. But people just didn't throw up their white hoods and go, okay, we're all equal now. They just did it in private. So in 1929, when women became persons under the law, we didn't get parades. Nobody gave us equal pay. They, men just looked down and said, ha ha, very funny, and I make my supper and take care of the kids. And we did it because that's what we did. But it's a generational change. So our daughters, you know, my mother wasn't a person. Now I can join the RCMP. I couldn't do that in 1973. Women weren't allowed in. My daughter's born in 2000. She lives in a world where she can't imagine not having the right to vote or equal pay or anything else or be told you can't be a police officer, you can't be a carpenter. You know, she doesn't live in that world. It's a generational change, and that's what the book gets into is that why weren't these cases solved? Not that nobody ca really cared. It's just that at that time, they're just wasn't an importance put on it. And you know, your character, your novels are both um, you know, great examples of weaving in these really complex, serious topics with, you know, edge of your seat suspense and really, you know, beautiful, complex, uh, interesting characters. So I have to ask you right before we finish up, what's next for you? What's your next book gonna be? Well, I just finished writing the screenplay for Operation Wormwood. I, I went back to Munn and did a, a course on how to write a screenplay. Wow. So I just finished a screenplay in that. I've also, uh, I wrote a play, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer, so I, I write a lot of things. Hey, ever. <laughs> I'm also doing, uh, so busy, but writing all the time, and I also wrote, uh, I'm in the process of writing the follow-up to Operation Wormwood right now, and I'm also writing a book on the RCMP. Uh, this is the 70th anniversary of the RCMP in Newfoundland and Labrador, and there are some fabulous stories, and I'm interviewing all these veterans and getting their stories, including the last living Newfoundland Rangers. There's only three Newfoundland Rangers left in the province. They're in their 90s, so I'm capturing their their stories now and uh, it's that book is fascinating and of course the follow-up to Operation Warwood I hope is going to be fashion, uh, fascinating and I hope it's going to be they're both going to be movies someday because I wrote these books specifically to be done in Newfoundland I always dreamed that they would be movies so I made them so specific you cannot tape <laughs> you cannot tape these books in Nova Scotia and pretend it's uh, Newfoundland smart. it has to be done here perfect well, looking forward to the next time you're back and we'll talk about your movies or your books and all the many projects you're working on. So thanks a lot for joining us and uh, thanks for writing those books. Thank you. So, thanks for having me. Thanks for reading them. Oh, no, my pleasure. And uh, we'll be right back with more Out of the Fog. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. watching Out of the Fog and thanks so much to Helen Eskett for joining us for an in-depth conversation about her two great novels, Operation Wormwood and Operation Vanish. Those are books that are available anywhere you can find books, uh, so be sure to pick them up and have a read because they are a great read. Uh, thanks again to Helen and uh, see you next time on Out of the Fog.
the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Looking for great seats to all the action? Rogers Super Sports Pack delivers. With NBA League Pass, get up to 40 out-of-market games every week, all season long. More dunks, more slams, more to love, live in HD. NBA League Pass, part of the Rogers Super Sports Pack. All this for only $35.95 a month. Order through your remote on channel 431 or call 1-888-ROGERS-1 today. Your visit isn't really necessary. I'll judge for myself. I know you're an MP, Miss McPhail, but a woman has never... I am not leaving till I do. 